Start recording. Start webinar. Oh my God. Oh. Okay. Five seconds. Wonderful. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us uh, once again. Uh, if you were trying earlier to uh, to see the legend who is Adam Meekins, um, apologies for the technical issues, um, but uh, he's very kindly decided uh, to come back, give us another go. Uh, and uh, without too much further ado, over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Matthew. So yeah, uh, second time lucky. Oh, look, and Jack just popped up and joined us as well. That's perfect timing, isn't it? I heard the, I heard the apologies, and I, I, but this is what's fun for me, is that for those that don't know, Matthew Skarsbrook has just teed it up perfectly, but it's really good that Matthew's going to be on here. We're going to tag team the Q&A. One, one of the most uh, sensible massage therapists in the game talking about Mr. Where's the T-shirt anti-manual therapy. So I'm going to go and I'm going to come back and referee this in a little while, but apologies, as has been said, that you missed it, but I'm just noticing now on the audience tally that people are flooding in, and so I hope you can accept our apologies. So Adam, you've got two lots of Adam because that recording is still available. So thanks a lot, guys. I'll leave you to it, and I'll see you in the Q&A. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, cheers, buddy. All right, so I'm going to get cracking then, and I am going to, as I say, try the second time lucky. So for those of you who tried to join me this morning, thank you for sticking with it and coming to join me this afternoon particularly on a glorious uh, heat wave that we're having in the UK here today. It's currently about 300 degrees in my little office up here. So I am sweating rather profusely, like a fat kid in a cake shop, as they say. So uh, without further ado, let's get on with it and talk something about a little bit cooler. Let's talk about frozen shoulders. So frozen shoulders, I think, are a fascinating and frustrating condition that I see a lot of. So I work here as an upper limb specialist and I see a lot of people with the diagnosis frozen shoulder. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit, I say, around what is a frozen shoulder, what's it all about and how do we best manage it? Now, Jack asked me to start off my talk with something controversial to grab your attention. So here you go. There's a there's a slide to start off with, as I say, with a bit of a controversial statement that everything you have been told about frozen shoulders is wrong. I think what we have got to realize is that frozen shoulder is still a condition that we have very little evidence on when you look at it. And actually, there's still a lot of gray areas and lots of areas of uncertainty around what is a frozen shoulder. So I think there are some common misconceptions, myths, if you want to call them, around frozen shoulders. The first one is that they're all capsular conditions. So classically, frozen shoulder is considered to be a condition, a pathology of the capsular tissue of the shoulder. But again, I think we can start to realize that it isn't always the case. Uh, the other common, common uh, misconception is how long they take to uh, resolve. So there's this timeline often of around 12 to 18 months that most people are told uh, that frozen shoulders last for. But again, it's not that simple, which we'll look into a little bit more. Also, this uh, assumption is that they're spontaneously resolving, is that they'll get better on their own if left to their own devices. And again, I think we have got to look at that and say, perhaps with a critical eye, that's not always the case. And how's the best way to manage the stiff, painful, frozen shoulder? Again, lots of assumptions about it needing lots of static stretching, passive stretching and manual therapy. But again, when you look at the effects of those treatments, we don't see it making much uh indent or improvements on person's range of movement, their pain or their functional ability. Also, the other thing to consider is what do we mean by the term frozen shoulder? It is a confusing condition for clinicians because every clinician talks about frozen shoulder. They might mean something different than another clinician. So if it's confusing for us healthcare clinicians, how do you think it is for our patients who are given the diagnosis of frozen shoulder? Personally, I don't think frozen shoulder is a diagnosis. It's an umbrella term that covers a stiff and painful shoulder. And so that's what I tend to call them, as you can see here. But other people will call frozen shoulders different things. Contracted shoulder syndrome. Sometimes a frozen shoulder is classified as idiopathic or traumatic. Sometimes it's classed now as primary or secondary. And another term we use quite a lot is adhesive capsule. 
Uh, but I'm not a fan of that term. Um, I think, again, the term adhesions and adhesive can sometimes be a little bit fear inducing. It can sometimes give people the misunderstanding and misrepresentation uh, if they've got adhesions in their shoulders. How this term adhesive capsulite has got into our healthcare terminology is, say, is going way back into the 1940s when a, a US orthopedic surgeon was trying to investigate why these people had painful stiff shoulders with normal looking x rays back then. So he operated on a few of these shoulders and he thought he saw the capsule adhere to the humeral head. And so he coined this term adhesive capsulitis and the term has stuck ever since. But actually, there are no adhesions in capsulitis. So I don't use the term adhesive capsulitis. I use the term capsulitis, um, but it's not adhesive. So frozen shoulder is a, probably not a definition to use for a diagnosis, but it's an umbrella term that we use to describe a severely painful shoulder or upper arm with a significant loss of both active and passive range of movement. Our role, okay, is to try and work out what is the cause of this stiff and painful shoulder, this frozen shoulder. Is it because of stiffness of the tissue? So that is the capsule problems, the tendons and the muscles, and dare I say that dreaded word fascia. I know everybody looks to talk about fascia at the moment. Is it because of stiffness of the joints? Is there an arthropathy? Is it OA? Is it an RA type problem? And then there's also the stiffness of the brains, the frozen brain, as I call it. So is that a shoulder that's stiff and painful because of overprotection, overguarding, fear, kinesophobia, et cetera? And then very rarely we do get the stiff nasties. We get the serious pathologies that can also cause a severely painful, grossly restricted shoulder joint. So that can be fractures, avascular necrosis, and of course, serious and sinister pathologies. So let's talk about capsulitis, first of all, probably again, the most common theory reason for people getting severely acute painful shoulders that have a gross loss of range of movement. Now capsulitis is a thing. We do see a, a distinct path pathophysiology occurring to the shoulder capsule. This rather aggressive angiogenesis that's triggered off for various different reasons. Again, when we look at the, the, the ways that we try to ca uh, classify capsulitis, you'll see there's lots of probable suspects that triggers off a aggressive angiogenesis of the glenohumeral joint capsule. Now this aggressive angiogenesis Angiogenesis, this vascularization of the joint capsule, increases fibroblast proliferation, which increases collagen fiber production, which gets laid down in a very haphazard, disorganized format, which causes the capsule of the joint to thicken and contract. Now, can you can see this pathophysiology occurring with the eyeball? When you actually go in and scope a shoulder in the early stages of a capsulitis, you will see this aggressive angiogenesis process occurring. So here you can see two pictures of an arthroscope taken inside the glenohumeral joint. On the left, we can see a normal shoulder with no vascularization of the capsule. And on the right, we can see capsulitis in effect. It's basically turned the capsule uh, pink and red. Now, capsulitis appears to affect around about two to five percent of the general population, depending on which literature you read. And again, same with the di different types of literature you read. There does appear to be a slightly more prevalence in females than males, but that's not 100 percent conclusive. This classification of capsulitis, we used to use the term and some people still do use the terms idiopathic and traumatic capsulitis. Uh, however, I think that's now been slowly moved away from and more people are now using the different classification system of primary or secondary capsulitis. So primary was like old idiopathic of unknown origin. We cannot think of a trigger or a factor that has caused you to develop this pathophysiology of the capsule. And then we know there is secondary factors. And I think realistically, most people with capsulitis have a secondary factor that has triggered them. Uh, off to get this pathology. And secondary uh, capsulitis has now been subdivided into either systemic factors, extrinsic factors, or intrinsic factors. So these are these things that are perceived to believe to be higher risk factors for developing capsulitis. So obviously we have the systemic factors. So metabolic syndromes, diabetes, unfortunately, we know there's a higher prevalence of capsulitis in those groups. Cardiovascular disease as well, inflammatory conditions, and even genetic predispositions. Our extrinsic and intrinsic factors can be things like low physical activity. So just general sedentariness is also perceived to be a potential triggering factor for capsulitis after any type of trauma, either general trauma or localized trauma to the shoulder. Sometimes it can occur after obviously strokes with, again, paralysis leading to a, a capsulitis 
and sometimes it can occur after something benign as a rotator cuff tendinopathy or a small uh, shoulder surgery like an arthroscopy. Again, the reasons why are still very unclear. Now, the classic stages is also something that you've probably heard about with frozen shoulder. So capsulitis is thought to go through three distinct stages, the freezing stage, the frozen stage, and the thawing stage. But again, these stages were put out there by um, expert opinion. When you actually look into the literature to try and see if there is any supporting uh, evidence for these stages, we can't really find it. We do know that frozen uh, capsulitis moves through a stage of pain and goes into a stiff phase. The so pain does calm down initially. So that's the way that I tend to classify capsulitis. I use a much more simpler for classification system. It's either a painful capsulitis or it's a stiff capsulitis. What is the predominant problem for that individual with this painful stiff shoulder? Is it the pain or is it the stiffness? Now, again, how long a capsulitis takes to resolve, again, in the literature is not quite clear. It was something that surprised me when I started doing a bit of background reading around this. I had been underestimating the average duration of capsulitis quite a lot. I'd been saying this 12 to 18 months to most people. But actually, when you look at the average, the mean duration of capsulitis from onset of symptoms to resolution, you see the average is around 30 months, so a lot more than 18. Now, there is a wide spectrum of uh, time ranges. We can see from 12 to 42 tends to be the average. But there are also some case reports out there that it can take up to seven years for some individuals to have resolution of capsulitis. And that leads me on to the nice other point I want to talk about. Does capsulitis resolve? Well, again, when you look into the literature, you do see this common uh, claim of spontaneous resolutions with papers like this one at the top here that I presented that says 90% of people with idiopathic capsulitis or frozen shoulder, when they follow them up between two to 27 years, and this is retrospective studies, obviously, they find that they haven't had to treat them. But we've got to recognize these are orthopedic surgeons talking about surgical management. So they are saying, I don't have to operate on capsulitis 90% of the time. And I totally agree with that. But to actually say they spontaneously resolved, I think is not fair. So I do think, again, when we use the term spontaneous resolution, we've got to be a little bit careful. What I often tell people with suspected capsulitis is nothing gets better by doing nothing. So I don't think we need to intervene with aggressive interventions all the time with capsulitis, but it does need to be managed and it does need to be looked after. So what gives us the indications that somebody has a capsulitis as a cause of their frozen shoulder? Well, classically, capsulitis appears to affect a certain age range. So the 50-year age is a good clue, first of all, plus or minus 10 years old. The Japanese actually call it the 50-year-old shoulder. Their onset of symptoms tends to be quite severe and sudden over a short duration. Now that duration can sometimes be a couple of days, sometimes a couple of weeks, and then they start to get this severe pain and also a gross loss of range of movement. It's a very severely irritable and painful condition. So it's not a subtle background ache. It doesn't hurt every now and again. It's a constant unrelenting pain and it's very easily upset and agitated. Sometimes somebody just knocking the arm brushing past it, giving it a little jar of sharp movement can send somebody with a capsulitis through the roof. Or they'll forget and they'll go and move their arm a little bit too fast, challenging that end of range. And again, it takes their breath away and brings tears to their eyes. It's not a subtle condition. It causes a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort and very easily irritated. Their location of symptoms will not be specific either, a very wide, diffuse uh, presentation of pain all around the shoulder, even down into the lower arm occasionally as well. Their disabilities and their problems, again, won't be just one or two things. It's going to be a grossly disabling condition. It's going to affect their quality of, of sleep. It's going to affect their day-to-day -day abilities. It's going to affect all their tasks. They're probably not going to report many things that help alleviate it. Even at rest, they will have pain. And again, when we delve into their medical history, their lifestyle factors, we'll probably see more suspicions of these secondary factors, giving us, again, an increased suspicion that this person has a capsulitis. Our simple ex uh, examination to confirm a capsulitis is we're looking for, again, a severely restricted range of movement around the glenohumeral joint, both actively and passively lost. So we can't change the movement with a bit of assistance. And there's a pain provocation at the end of range, a severe pain provocation at the end of range. Now, classically, that's going to affect elevation and external rotation, but it does grossly affect all movements as well. 
Um, we also I so like to do some isometric testing. And the idea here is just to make sure that there is no major pain provocation. And again, a way I try to differentiate whether this is something else rather than a capsulitis is when I ask them to do an isometric contraction, they may be weak because they're reluctant, they're fearful, they've got pain, but they normally don't get pain provocation on isometric contractions. The next question to discuss is what role does imaging have to play with a capsulitis? Currently in the UK, the British Orthopaedic Association is you cannot confirm or diagnose somebody with capsulitis without getting at least a plain film x-ray to make sure that there is no arthritic changes in the joint. So the argument is, is, say, is to get an x-ray with every person with suspected capsulitis just to ensure that it isn't something bony masquerading as a capsular problem. So that can be OA. But the other one also to keep an eye out for is osteonecrosis or avascular necrosis. So this was an x-ray of a lady who came into my clinic a couple of years ago now. Classic presentation of capsulitis. I was so confident I was going to bet my left testicle that the x-ray was going to come back normal. Uh, luckily, I didn't bet my left testicle, but uh, the patient after the x-ray came back and this popped up on my screen. My jaw hit the floor and I was very surprised. So this is a, a case of a severe osteonecrosis of her humeral head. She had none of the risk factors in her history that would have predisposed her. So she had no steroids, no previous history of trauma, nothing along those lines that would have given us an indication she was going to be a uh, AVN patient, but she was. So I, luckily, I was glad that I got that x-ray because it changed our management. We would have treated her as a capsulitis, but obviously we had to change our management plan when we saw this x-ray. The other argument is also to get an x-ray to exclude any serious or sinister uh, problems that can masquerade as capsulitis. So the nasties, things like chondrosarcomas or osteosarcomas that can grow on shoulders and sometimes mimic frozen shoulders or capsulitis. The trouble is, is that x-rays are not very sensitive or specific for picking these things up, particularly in the earlier stages. So I think sometimes that can lead you into a bit of false uh, security and thinking that there isn't anything serious or sinister in there just because the x-ray is normal. We have to recognize that sometimes in the early stages, these things are very hard to detect. But if you have suspicions that there may be something else going on rather than just a simple capsulitis, uh, then I would suggest getting an MR because it's a lot more sensitive and specific for detecting sinister pathology in the early stages. So obviously, you know, your classic red flags will be coming into play for things like tumors. You're going to be asking a few questions around night pain. But again, capsulitis gets night pain. You're going to be asking questions around other signs and symptoms, night sweats, fevers, sudden unexplained weight loss. OK, are they rapidly deteriorating now? Again, in the early stages, capsulitis does that as well. Have they got past history of cancers in their, in their medical history and any other unusual signs and symptoms? So again, it's very hard in the early stages to separate a capsulitis, which does present with many of these red flag signs and symptoms, uh, opposed to trying to differentiate it from something a bit more serious and sinister. So again, I don't want you to worry. It's a low instance. There's less than 1% of capsulitis that have something serious and sinister, but you still just have to keep your wits about you. And again, it's about remaining vigilant rather than thinking you can rule out these things. Now, the other thing to also consider is the capsulitis that's not a true capsulitis, the capsulitis that presents like a capsulitis, but isn't actually a patho pathological changing of the capsule tissue around the shoulder. So this person has a very painful, very stiff, very uh, uncomfortable shoulder, but actually they don't have any capsular changes. We know these people exist because of these small studies that have been done uh, over the years. So this one was done by Louise Holman, uh, where she uh, uh, took a group of people diagnosed with capsulitis, frozen shoulders, uh, and placed them under general anesthesia. And there was only five people in this small trial. And out of the five people in this trial, all of them had full range of movement when the patient was under general anesthesia. I'm just going to show you a quick little video of one of her subjects. So this is the patient just before they go for anesthesia. She's trying to actively abduct her arm, severe active restriction into abduction. Louise is now trying to passively elevate her arm before she goes under general anesthesia. Again, pain response at end can't go any further than active range. Now the patient's under general anesthesia, so she's unconscious now. She has full range of movement restored. So there cannot be a capsular problem with this shoulder because if there was a capsular problem, even with the patient unconscious, you would not have that same amount of range of movement. So again, this is starting to give us an indication that there are individuals out there that I call don't have capsulitis, they have frozen brains. 
All right. So their brains are limiting uh, their range of movement because of various different factors. Normally it's negative beliefs, it's fear, it's lack of confidence, anxiety, depression, low self-efficacy, et cetera. All these things will affect somebody's ability to move. If somebody doesn't feel confident or happy to move, they won't move. And our ability to test that sometimes is very challenging. It's very difficult to do. So to be able to determine somebody with a true passive stiffness versus somebody with a guarded overprotective stiffness is very, very challenging. Um, again, the other thing to consider as well, we also know that stiffness is a perception, not of change of tissue uh, quality. So you sometimes feel or see a lot of people that have stiffness after exercising. So it can be a sign of fatigue. It's also seen as a sign of fear as well. Uh, this study here done uh, this year actually looked at people with chronic neck pain, so upper trapezius pain, who were complaining of chronic stiffness and tightness in there. And they compared the stiffness of these muscles using shear wave elastography compared to control groups and found absolutely no difference in the actual tissues structure. Yet these individuals were convinced that their structures were tight and stiff. So again, we've got to, just got to recognize stiffness can be an output of the symptom, okay, rather than the act uh, of the nervous system, rather than the actual tissue itself. So what gives you some indications that somebody may have a frozen brain rather than a frozen shoulder? Well, you're going to be probably more suspicious of the individual who's displaying a lot of signs of fear, tension, anxiety, etc., who does display during your assessment some reluctance to be touched or to be moved, who has probably widespread pains into other areas and maybe again being hypersensitive to other non-noxious stimulus. These all start to increase your suspicion that they may be going to be protected and guarded around their body and therefore not truly allow you to assess their passive range. Some little clues and tips you may also use to try and see whether somebody has a frozen brain rather than a frozen shoulder is to do a couple of little tests where you try to change the context of the movement around the shoulder and see if you see a change in range of movement. One of the simplest ones is checking range of movement with somebody standing up or sitting compared to lying down, particularly external rotation. If you see a sudden change in external rotation range of movement when somebody's lying down compared to when somebody's standing up, you're going to suspect that there may be some guarding mechanisms going on there. And that goes for things like moving the body around the arm rather than moving the arm around the body. So if somebody has some restrictions into elevation when they're trying to lift their arm up, how about you fix their arm and try to get them to drop their head or their trunk below their shoulder? Again, if you see a sudden change in range of movement or dramatic range of movement, you're going to be suspicious. This is probably not a true capsulitis. This is a frozen brain. Now, whether you think you've got a frozen brain or a frozen shoulder, they all need good advice and education. We know how important advice and education is in helping people recover from pains and problems. So when it comes to things like frozen shoulders, I think sometimes we're guilty of self-fulfilling prophecies. We are very negative. We are very pessimistic. OK, and we often under treat, I think, frozen shoulders. And I think by being negative and pessimistic and under treating people with it, it then leads them to having these long term problems. So what I'd like to try and do is try to be a bit optimistic, but honest. OK, we have to recognize if it is a capsulitis, it isn't going to resolve quickly. But we do want to try and give them some optimism that they can be managed well. And the key is managing them well. Now, not everybody needs a lot of interventions, but some frozen shoulders, some capsulitises will do. Now, when it comes to management options, I think we always got to try and promote, obviously, good quality self-management. We've got to give the individual some advice and education and ideas of how to self-manage it. I think steroid injections, I'm not one for banding around and promoting steroid injections for many things, but in true capsulitis, I do think they can be beneficial. Physiotherapy for most, I think, is beneficial as well. And very rarely do I recommend a capsulitis needs surgery, but some do. So when it comes to self-management, obviously, we want to try and give the individual some ways and strategies to help reduce their pain. One of the simplest ways I like to try and help people with pain coming from a capsulitis is not actually focusing just on the shoulder, but getting their general physical activity increased. I get them to increase their physical activity to try and get the heart rate up. That can be going for a brisk walk, a gentle cycle ride or something, something that just encourages those natural endogenous opioid mechanisms to kick in. That, I think, again, can help either distract or help alleviate the pain coming from this a capsulitis type problems. Things like gentle isometrics and hot packs as well are also nice options to give some temporary relief. 
I think range of movement type exercises, again, in the early stages, want to be gentle. We don't want to be pushing through pain. Again, like we said, capsulitis is very easily upset. So we want to try and maintain range of movement and gently encourage it without going into too much pain. This is a condition that's definitely not no pain, no gain in the early stages. And the other thing to consider is let's try and give our individuals some lifestyle advice and education as well. Again, capsulitis often tends to be a pathology of poor lifestyle decisions. Now, and again, I know physios get a little bit you know, upset and a little bit awkward about, well, this is not my job. I'm overstepping my boundaries here. But I think giving some individuals some advice and guidance about their diet, about smoking, about stress and anxiety management is part of what we do as healthcare professionals. So again, if you've got somebody with poor lifestyle choices and you found that out in your history some advice and education about how these things are affecting their current situation i think is very beneficial and helpful steroid injections like i said can help reduce pain temporarily in the early stages they're not a magic cure for capsulitis they are there simply to help it make it more bearable and reduce pain in the early stages however we do have to be uh, uh, quite open and honest that actually the quality of research about steroid injections for adhesive capsulitis, sorry, not adhesive capsulitis, just capsulitis, is poor because, again, poor methodology, lots of risk of bias and not well-designed trials that look at them. But they do, in my experience, seem to calm things down for a lot of people with capsulitis. It reduces their symptoms for a few weeks. But I always tell people it's not a magic cure. Lots of talk about hydrodistension injections as well. Again, you know, these are thought to help inflate the shoulder capsule to help stretch it out and restore its mobility. Again, lots of arguments, lots of advocates for when it comes to me looking at the research and my clinical experience, I don't recommend hydrodistension injections. Uh, the research current systematic reviews looking at some randomized controlled trials does shows it doesn't favor anything above and beyond just using normal corticosteroid injections. So why you'd want to do something that's a bit more complex and a bit more uncomfortable for an individual when you can get the same effect with something simpler and easier, I don't know. Surgery, as I said, may be an option for some. So again, the trouble is, is we haven't got good quality uh, evidence to support the role of surgery in frozen shoulder. There's arthroscopic release of contractures, manipulations under anesthetics. Again, surgeons have different choices about which one they prefer to use. Normally, it's the diabetic patients who, after a good year or two, haven't shown any sign of settling down or resolving. They're normally the individuals I would start discussing again around some surgical options there. So my summary when it comes to frozen shoulders are these things. OK, stage one in that painful stage, lots of advice, reassurance, education, increase their self-efficacy, reduce their fear and anxiety, encourage lots of self-management, including looking at their lifestyle, consider steroid injections to help them through the worst of the pain in those uh, uncomfortable stages. Next stage, once pain has naturally started to reduce, stiffness is now the main problem. Get them to do the say self-management, get them to do physiotherapy a little bit more aggressively. Little word about manual therapy. I'm going to overrun here, Matthew, so don't cut me off. I'm going to be five minutes late. OK, a few little less questions, but a little uh, rant about manual therapy. If you want to use manual therapy on frozen shoulder, give it a try if you want. Just recognize it doesn't do any of these bullshit things that a lot of manual therapists think it does. It doesn't break down scar tissue. It certainly doesn't release adhesions. Um, the basic science tells you this. When you look at the actual amount of force needed to deform shoulder capsule tissue, uh, you see it needs an astronomical amount of force. So this study here done by Itoi in Japan looked at cadavers, shoulder capsules, to see how much force they could stand before they started to deform. And you can see it's in the hundreds of kilograms. How much force is applied during manual therapy? Well, again, this paper by Tolbert looked at that, and we're seeing about 20 kilograms. There is absolutely no way manual therapy is done at the sufficient intensity, sufficient force, or sufficient time to actually create any structural changes to joint capsules. Static stretching is also another cause or another recommendation to use for frozen shoulders. I don't think there's anything too bad with static stretching. It's not my go-to preferred option to manage them. Trouble with static stretching, again, it doesn't tend to change tissue very easily or quickly. Again, the forces applied are too brief and too low to actually create any structural effect around there. It's not that it doesn't change movement. Static stretching can change ranges of movement, but it's not because you've changed the tissue. Most of the time, it's this neurological effect. You become less or more tolerant to the stretching sensations. 
My preferred strategy to try and mobilize uh, stiff shoulders is with heavy, slow eccentric loading. Uh, what we find with a heavy eccentric loading is you create a much easier effect in actually changing tissues because the forces are higher. It'll help improve range of movement and also gets individuals strong at the same time. So I call it strength stretching. OK, it's a combination of stretching and strengthening together. How to do it for frozen shoulders? Well, there's lots of different ways. There's a couple of methods that I tend to use. So I call them dumbbell fallouts. You just give somebody a dumbbell and let them slowly let it work their way out into external rotation. And I find the cable pull up, okay, is also a nice way, again, to get a stretch through elevation. My guidelines of how often and what type of frequency to use strength stretching for frozen shoulders are these things from my personal experience. I've got no evidence to back this up, but I normally find a couple of sessions a week is enough because it does agitate it. Uh, so they need a day or two in between to settle down. They want to do it as slow as possible with a weight that they feel as heavy as they can do. But it doesn't want to be so stupidly heavy that it increases their fear, increases their anxiety and obviously causes a shitload of pain that lasts for a long time afterwards. The other good news is because they're doing it slowly with heavy weights, they don't have to do too many reps or sets as well. So the last thing to just finish off with is to say is please recognize, although that we are dealing with frozen shoulders, capsulitis, whatever else it is, okay, let's recognize there's always a person attached to that stiff and painful shoulder. And sometimes it's how we manage that person that's more important than how we manage their shoulder. So on that note, I think I've managed to just about get it in there in time. Sorry, it was a little bit uh, hot and fast coming at you. Um, if you've got any questions, I'll take them now. And if you want to listen to me talking a little bit slower and going into a bit more depth around um, frozen shoulders, then please come and join me uh, on my shoulder complex course that you can find out in the handouts there where I am doing a live and online version currently at the moment with COVID. And on that note, whew, I'm going to have a drink of water. And I, am I was going to say, I, I, I'm going to congratulate you. you. You about a minute over, but that was that was pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the questions that came through is, are you actually sat in your pants, as uh, alluded to on Twitter? Do you want me to stand up? No, no, no one wants that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and Ben Cormack's asking, where is the shirt and tie? Oh, mate, I don't, I don't wear shirt and ties even when I have to go to court, let alone when I have to go presenting to things. No. <laughs> um, well, because you did overrun um, and because clearly this is probably one of the biggest setups of Therapy Live to ask a self-professed massage therapist to come and moderate Adam Meekins, um, I'm going to I'm gonna take the advantage that I've got, basically, and throw one of my questions out there, if that's all right. Go um, for it, mate, That's yeah. not to say there aren't some fantastic ones we'll come to. So, um, Frozen Brain. You reference obviously on your uh, on your slide that anxiety, depression, fear, all those kind of things uh, can play a big part in Frozen Brain. Mm -hmm. How do you treat frozen brain? And on the basis that I am 100% with you on what manual therapy does not do, but that manual therapy, specifically massage therapy, does clinically reduce depression and anxiety, would you consider using massage therapy or referring them to massage therapy in a, in a case of frozen brain? Uh, as much as it pains me to say this, simply put, yes, you know. So again, I'm I know I've got it. Yeah, you've got it recorded. You can put it out there. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bit less harder line than I normally do with manual therapy. I I know it can, you know, when used rationally, when used sensibly, it can have some good effects. So I'm not gonna say be a complete knobhead and say no, it can never be used because I know that comes across on social media quite a lot by me anyway. Um, all I will say is, again, and I'm going to reference a previous talk that I listened to earlier in the day, which was Derek Griffin's talk on exposure therapy. We've got to recognize when somebody has fear and anxiety about moving their shoulder, you know, we have to use the context specific techniques and treatments to try and help reduce that fear uh, of movement of that shoulder. So the only way somebody is going to say start to feel less fearful and anxiety around moving the shoulder is by them moving that shoulder. So and it does need to be active movement. It needs to be a movement that they perceive that they're in control of rather than somebody else doing it for them. So to answer that first part of your question, how would I reduce somebody's fear and anxiety of movement is by getting them to do the movement that they're fearful and anxious about through a graded exposure approach. But I do also recognize that, you know, a little bit of calm in soothing massage to just calm those neural pathways down a little bit, stop the brain screaming at somebody can sometimes help that 
process along the way. As long as there's no sort of, you know, dependence building on it, as long as that individual knows, you know, from a quite rational point of view about what it's doing, how it's doing it, why it's there for, they're not getting too addicted to it, then by all means, crack on and uh, do a little bit of massage or whatever magic techniques that everybody else likes to do a little bit of ap and pa gliding and all that sort of stuff it's all about the magic that was that was far too easy adam um you let me off there i'm sorry about that um (laughs) anyway shall we go to some of the other questions because there's some far more intelligent questions here as well far away um okay so i'm going based on the votes um (laughs) <laughs> and and Dave, um, I think Adam's answered it quite well. I'm not going to ask him what his favourite manual therapy is for adhesive capsulitis. Um, but uh, I thought you were going to ask him what my favourite manual therapy is for myself, and I could definitely answer that question. No, pants are on, remember. It right, Adam, do you have an opinion on the FROST trial results where no clinical significant difference between physio, MUA and release? Uh, do I have an opinion on it? Yeah, I find it an interesting um paper you know at the end of the day it's one of these things that we don't know how best to manage frozen shoulders because we don't really know what a true frozen shoulder is so whenever i see these trials my question is is how do they how do they know they've got a true capsulitis there or how do they know they haven't got somebody with a frozen brain and often you know the the way they they include a patient for these studies is by saying somebody has a severely painful and restricted range of movement in their shoulder. They actually haven't gone and further investigated to see whether there is a true pathological reason for this stiffness. So I think sometimes, yeah, papers and trials like this are showing us, you know, a lot of confusion because I think there's a very big mixture of patients with true capsulitis and patients with non-capsulitis all being lumped together. And therefore, you know, you're going to get very much much mixed results across all the treatment arms. Okay. So then building on that and to your point about the progression into a true capsulitis how do you differentiate at, a re- at that really early stage between a frozen shoulder and more uh, a pain limiting tendinopathy you can't is the simple answer it is one of these things that you know in the very early stages trying to decide somebody is having some other reason for a painful and restricted shoulder rather than a capsule problem is very challenging to do again it's all about increasing the index of suspicion and it's managing the uncertainty, which no human being likes doing. No human beings like things that are uncertain. But when it comes to severely painful and restricted shoulders, we need to manage uncertainty and have some doubts that, you know, this may be this, but it could also be this. It's about, you know, which one is the stronger suspicion? And that goes down again to your history. It's not so much the physical examinations. It will be more about what you find out from the patient their background, their fears, their beliefs, their anxieties, their other past medical histories, all those things there are going to help you increase your suspicion. Is it more likely to be a capsulitis than more likely to be a frozen brain? So somebody, you know, who's got lots of other health conditions, diabetes that's poorly controlled, uh, cardiovascular disease, sedentariness, et cetera, that's more likely to increase the suspicion that there is a capsulitis going on in there. Somebody who ha- doesn't have these health factors but is displaying fear and anxiety and catastrophization, they're unlikely to have a capsulitis and more likely to have a frozen brain. But they can look exactly the same when you look at them. Mm. Well, interestingly, that that builds into a, another question that was um, slightly further down the list. But uh, when you're dealing with that presentation, if you're dealing with someone who's diabetic or, or you have a suspicion that might be a component of their medical history, um, yeah. do you look at their, their sort of uh, insulin d- levels or, or, or do, you, do, you, do you get urinalysis, uh, urine analysis checks as part of what you would do for their shoulder? Absolutely. So again, we can't just as physiotherapists or as musculoskeletal therapists just get tunnel vision and only work in our silos when we're dealing with musculoskeletal conditions that are multifactorial because of lots of other health factors around it and like i said you know lifestyle factors as a driving cause for a lot of musculoskeletal conditions has to be looked at and has to be recognized now i'm not always the best person to do that because of my training and the time that i have in clinics but then it's about referring on it's about signposting them on So if I do have a diabetic who has a capsulitis, who couldn't give a shit about monitoring their blood sugar levels, has got a very poor lifestyle factor, I will approach that subject with them and say, look, you know, one of the reasons that you've probably got this condition is because of these other things going on in your health and probably this diabetes that's poorly controlled. Is there anything we can try to do to help you manage your diabetes better? 
Uh, is there something I could perhaps refer you on to? Would you want to go and see our diabetic nurse specialists for a mm. chat, you know, and a consultation there? So again, absolutely. It might not be my job to take, you know, urine measurements and tell them to take their blood sugar levels, but I definitely think it wants to be addressed and talked about so people then can then move on and see the appropriate person who can help them. Perfect. So in terms of the... Um yeah, the capsular contractions that are naturally resolving, all these restrictions that do appear to naturally resolve. Yeah. Do, do we have an explanation for that? Do you have an explanation for that? I, I think, again, it's the individuals that are more active and they just start to return back to normal activities. Um, and that allows the tissue to undergo some stresses and some strains. And then it starts to reverse the process that was developed in there. Yeah. So I think the more active an individual is, yes, the more likely it is to spontaneously resolve. But spontaneously resolve, again, is a term I, I don't use because it just gives the impression people can just sit back and do fuck all. And I'm yeah. saying, no, no, that's that's not what it's saying. It's just saying we've got to manage this and I think it has to be managed well and physical activity and exercise and movement is key to that so I do think you know the stresses and the strains around the tissues around the shoulder uh, the more they do the more likely they are to resolve yeah yeah in terms of another overlap uh, between us the your slide on uh, nothing gets better by doing nothing I think is spot on you know yep. um, and and you know from the manual therapy side uh, I think if someone is is providing manual therapy as the solution, they've got it wrong. Yeah, uh, it, it goes with anything in life. You know, we, we are not going to get anything done by just doing nothing. So, again, that's that term spontaneous resolution. It just implies we don't have to do nothing. I hate it. Yeah. So um, this is actually a new one on me. But um, David Poulter asks, apart from some frozen hips, why do we see frozen shoulders, but not commonly frozen ankles, knees, elbows, wrists? Dave Poulter with the difficult questions. Why am I not surprised about that? <laughs> Paul, how are you doing, buddy? Um, no, it's a great question. And it's one that I've pondered a lot over because it is a unique pathology to the shoulder, you know, capsulitis. We don't see capsulitis of many other joints, as he's already said. One of the theories I've got, and this is just a theory, and I am pulling it out of my ass, okay, I've got no evidence to support this, is that I think the shoulder is unique in its combination and sharing of non-contractile and contractile tissues around the actual humeral head. So when you look at the rotator cuff specifically, okay, you see a shitload of tenderness insertions into the capsule tissue. Part of the job of the rotator cuff is obviously to attach onto the humeral bone to help move the humerus, but it also has this role where it contracts and pulls on the capsule as well. So my theory is, is that say there's this merging of the capsule tissue and the non-capsule tissue of the cuff may be one of the factors for that. But I say I've got no absolute evidence for that. And everybody says, oh, that's bollocks, that's nonsense. And I'm like, yeah, it could be true. But, mm. you know, I do know that the capsule and the cuff are intimately linked because you cannot tear the rotator cuff without tearing the capsule of the shoulder joint. So I know there is this such a close indirect relationship. Was he worth the wait? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you pressed that poll because I was going to get shot. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a stupid question. I've just answered it for you. Okay. Now that's it. Uh, I mean, Jack, you've, you've obviously arrived with all of two minutes to spare. Have you got any questions or shall I continue? I've always got questions, but we've not got time for them, have we? But no, I, no, I, I knowing that it was two minutes to go, and I'm sorry, I was just making sure that Joe Gibson's talk is just mwah in the back end. So I was just hiding and helping her in the lobby. You know, I am so grateful that I did it before Joe, because Joe, you can never follow Joe Gibson. Never follow <laughs> Joe Gibson at all. I've had to do that twice in my career and yeah, I nearly retired. So it turns out that you lot think that Meekins was worth it. We've got 41 entries that say not, which if you're imagining a normal room, if Therapy Live was of a normal scale, and that'd be quite a lot of people disgruntled. But the fact it's that we haven't stood up yet. Just under 900 people saying he was worth it, then that's that's pretty good. I'm going to throw you out another poll, if you don't mind, please, guys. Uh, so we're going to close that one. Oh, he says, as if I know how to use this stuff. There we go. And then your final one, final minute. Answer this question for me. Can you rate this man out of five? These men, sorry, of course, that back I was going to say, I clearly have marked it five. Because but, yeah, but which is the good one and which is the bad one, Jack? Your immaculate beards. But uh, yeah, really say, I think five, with with five being the highest. You know, I think five, I brought it back. I think I think getting Adam Eakins to say yes to massage just. Wins. I heard, oh, well, well, I, I, heard, I, heard, I said yes. I, I said maybe it depends in the right <laughs> circumstances. 
It's just look, it's a slippery slope. He's being to the replay. <laughs> I don't want to be misquoted. Chris Paul <laughs> next week. Right. No, that was that's brilliant. Get you get your votes in, guys. That's just slowing down now. Get your votes in. Nine hundred and eighty-eight responses. Keep them coming, please. Get on the poll section if you haven't missed if you've missed it when it's flashed up on your screen. Final few minutes. So apologies again for this having to be delayed. Adam's absolutely smashed it out of the park and, and lots of you have enjoyed it. In fact, there's been over 2,000 at times in this session from what I spotted um, and, uh, and even the responses to the poll, which is only ever going to be a fraction of you, is over 1,000. So if we think about the scale of this, I'm so glad that you can hear some messages as important as these, as well as the challenges that we want to bring in a physio matter style of which Matt's just been able to do better than, than I ever could. So it's absolutely brilliant. So thank you both. Uh, thank you all for watching. Make sure you check out all the other education streams that are going to close the day out because we finish with an absolute flourish. We've also got a brilliant session that's just been retrofitted because one of the things we've got is a great competition prize from Rehab My Patient. Uh, who are doing shoulder rehab principles and some of the exercise variables around that. So Rehab My Patient and Tim Allardyce are going to do a session at the end of the day on the exercise rehab stream where we're going to give away an exclusive prize uh, from our massive pot of goodies. If you haven't spotted it already, we're also doing a pub quiz tonight on Facebook. Me and Gemma Oliver are going to do eight till nine tonight, beer and wine, and we've got some really funny uh, games for us to play. Uh, so do join us on there if you haven't already spotted that on Facebook. So... Um, I'll wrap this up. Let's open this. Let's close that poll and declare those answers. You've done all right there, Meekins. You've done all yeah, right. Don't thanks, guys. Sorry I was a bit fast, coming in a bit hot, but, you know, 30 uh, minutes is no great. time. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you've, you've got 95% of the people have put fours and fives. That's a, that's a result. So, well done, guys. Uh, I will do the, I'll do the uh, honours on the admin then, Matt. All right.